Lord, well, we give God praise. We're so grateful, thankful once again. As we honor the heavens, we're acknowledging his sovereignty, the absoluteness of his being. And he is magnificent. Once again, we're so thankful and grateful that we get an opportunity once again to be standing before the throne in the presence of God's people. And all of you that are gathered here, we're thanking God tonight. For those of you that are within the sound of our voice, and those of you in our Facebook family, we want to acknowledge you. And those of you whatever other social media outlet in which you're listening, uh, we're just grateful. We want to bring you greetings tonight. And we do bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so on tonight as we're repairing our hearts tonight, we're getting ready. Um, tonight we're getting ready to approach the throne. We're going to go before the heavens. But tonight, as, as I want to give you some passages of scriptures that we're kind of looking to go to. But in case we get caught up and don't get a chance to get back, I just want you uh, to, to have these verses. And y'all know we've been talking about the trifecta and the trifecta of the hour, the time in which we're ending, or which we're in. And you know, we kind of set things up because we wanted people to understand, to know that we're in a transitional period, transitional time. And we told you about the, uh, about the period of transition that is threefold. That when you talk transition, you're talking about coming from the familiar, the known, uh, that which uh, those known structures, those permanent structures, and we use it as an example when God spoke to Abram, and we spoke to Abram and said, "Get the out, get out from your father's house." We told him, in other words, another term for the father's house is a permanent dwelling. It's kind of like the home house. It's kind of where everybody goes back to. And what God was telling him said, "Abram, get out from your father's house. Get out from that permanent dwelling." Get out from that place of security, familiarity, and where things are certain and sure. And God said, I'm going to send you. Now think about how adverse this was. I'm bringing you out from your father's house where we know, uh, we know what the systems are. We know what the instructions are. We know that he's a provider. We know that he's a, he's a source. We know he's a founder. And we know that he's a nurturer and nourisher. All the things that in fatherhood... Uh, that was there and has been proven, things that have been fruit proven and, and affirmed and established. It's an established place. And so when God pulls you out from an established place, pulls you out from a foundational place, pull you out from where known systems and known structures are already, things are already designed, already set in place. And then God says, get thee out from that place. And all of a sudden, God says, I'm going to take you to a city who's building makers God, and you don't know exactly where you're going. And so you're having to follow God, and you're having to do it by heart. In other words, now, you're being directed and led by the Spirit. In other words, as Abram's is getting out from that permanent dwelling, and now God is telling him to get him a tent. And you know to have a tent indicts that you can, when God speaks to you, you can lift, you can pull up stake. You can be able to go anywhere he needs you to go because you can just nail the stakes down. You can uproot them at any time. So in that, as God is beginning to direct us, so that's what we're talking about now. And we're talking about it because from the standpoint of moving from that permanent place in transition, and that's kind of where we are now. People are out here are trying to play it by ear because they don't know when they're going to get a vaccine. They don't know when they're going to get a serum. serum. They don't know when this thing is going to stop. They don't know when there's going to be an end to the corona. And everybody's hoping it's soon. And, and there are people still trying to hoping that by July, mid-July, in August, maybe we'll be clear. Maybe it'll be where we need to be before we can be able to get out and do this. But in the meanwhile, back at the ranch, this transition that we're in, because we don't know when you're going to do that. So if you don't know when you're going to do something, and it tells you, but yet you got to do something, that's something that is an activity, there is a requirement, there is a demand, there is a request, and heaven is, is an, aspiring for something to be done in a place like that. And you, and you're not, you know you move from what they call normal, and broke, what you, you could count on, what you could rely on, and what, what's familiar you, and yet you had to move from that place. And so here we are now, in which this is what we talk about, and I won't get into it tonight, but when we talk about wine skins, and we're talking, think about it for a moment when Jesus comes into town and he's talking about new wine, because remember, he's bringing a whole new system in, and he's bringing a whole new infrastructure in, and he's teaching them because now here he is introducing the kingdom, and he's talking about now because think about it the old system, the law, in terms of people, how they operate, how they function, in terms of moving in the laws, old sacrifices, and all the things. And now Jesus is teaching and bringing in a new order, and he's bringing a new invitation. So, you know, I know it's been said to you in time of old, in time of old, that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, and all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your might. And then you love your neighbor as thyself. But Jesus said, but a new commandment I give unto you. That now I want you to begin to love, I want you to begin to love men as I have loved you. So now he's, this is a whole new, 
whole new skin, whole new infrastructure, whole new system, whole new institution, whole new level of operation. So now you got to begin to research and go back. You can't go, you can't go back and find out and search the law. You can't go back to the script. If you're going to see how he loved you, and I remind you he's in the planet, and they got to pay attention to how he's operating, how he's functioning. And, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, a little bit more about that, because remember, he's bringing in a whole kingdom order. He's curious. He's bringing a whole nother Lord. You know, anytime you start talking about kingdom, you're bringing in another lordship. And when you're talking about bringing another lordship, you're bringing in another landowner, someone who, who has ownership. Because a lord, when we say Adonai, we say he's lord. When we say he's sovereign. We're saying that he's the landowner. You're talking about someone who owned the property. When we talk about a kingdom, you're talking about a king who owns the land. The land that they got is what they own. That's, it's their property. So they are landlords. And so when Jesus is teaching the kingdom and he's talking about another kingdom, he's talking about another lord. He's talking about another landowner. At the time in Rome, we know that Caesar was the landowner. He was the king at that time. And he was the one who owned the property, owned the land at that particular time. And here Jesus come in the midst of that, introducing a whole new infrastructure, a whole new system of operating. So as a result of that, the people that he's speaking to, you're going to mind, mind you through Judaism and think about the law and Moses and all what people have learned up until that time. And all of a sudden now this rigid, structured system that they were accustomed to. And all of a sudden Jesus is bringing in grace in new dimensions, new spheres. And he's bringing up, introducing a whole other operation. And so now they got to change their, their mindset, their concept, their ideology, their thought patterns. Because here's the issue. Jesus is bringing a whole new philosophy to the planet. Now, you know, when you're talking about bringing a philosophy, you're talking about people, ideologies, thought patterns, learned patterns, the way people think about doing things, a new way of doing things. Because your philosophy is in, is in your philosophy is not only is encompasses your ideologies, uh, your, your thought patterns, uh, your, your personality, your style, uh, the, way, the way that you operate, the way you do things, and, in, and you know that your concepts. When we say ideologies, I'm the concepts. You're talking about uh, patterns in which you have you developed over the years and, and, and course the way you do things and the way you see things need to be done. Well, in that, that's what your philosophy is composed of. And then when you but then once you develop through ideology, thought patterns, concepts, ideas, and then styles and lifestyles and, and what and the patterns and, and series, and when you learn that, think about it. Now your philosophy shifts in where you come get your theology from. And so now as you, you, you develop your theology from your philosophy, and many people got the, the philosophies that are not good. They're old rigid, old order, old, they're the old order, old patterns, old models, and they're not up to date. They're not where he is. And so as a result of when let's start talking transition, all of a sudden he's impacting your philosophy, your ideologies, your thought patterns, your learned patterns, your ideas, your concepts. All that is shifting. And that's how you're letting the new skin, in other words, your heart stand, the things that God has revealed to you, that he's established, that's starting to set boundaries for the way you're going to live your life, all of a sudden, all that stuff shifts. So we start talking about paradigm shifts, we start talking about transition, we start talking about trifecta of awakening, shaking, and visitation. Now I just want to see you to see all the things that are involved. Now, in that, I was telling you that some of the verses we want to use. Number one, I'm going to use Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're not going to go there first, but I'm giving you this Matthew 9, ninth chapter, verse 35. Verse 35, we may go, go to 34, 34, coming into 35. And also, Matthew 34, then we're going to talk about Matthew 4, 23, 24, and maybe 25. Also, we're going to talk about uh, Hebrews 12, chapter, verse, possibly verse 26, 27, 28. We're going to talk about those verses. Because one of the things that we want to make sure that people are capturing so we can make sure that we're moving, we're tracking, we're keeping up with where God is and what he's doing. So now I'm going to get you to come go with me tonight as we approach the throne. Come go with me. Father, once again, we're grateful, we're thankful, we're privileged tonight. As we surrender before the throne, we're honoring the heavens. We're acknowledging your sovereignty, the absoluteness of your being, the magnificence of your person. You're awesome. There is no other God beside you. And God, as I'm entreating the people tonight, and we're coming before the throne, we expect that tonight, we're believing for heaven's power, we're believing you right now. You, in, in this place, begin to reveal that which is in your heart, on your mind. I surrender tonight. I recognize my frailty. I know, God, tonight that I need the heavens to speak. Holy Spirit, we know we don't know what to pray for as we are, but you are. You make an intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered in articulated speech. 
And so we know that you're the one who searches the heart. You know the mind of the spirit. And you make an intercession for us according to the perfect will of God. And then 28 verses, and we know all things work together for good and for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And so tonight, Holy Spirit, you're our helper, you're our teacher, you're our leader, you're our counselor, you're our guide, you're our instructor. And so we'll believe in tonight, we're agreeing tonight, we'll look into you tonight, we're expecting your power to be revealed and manifested. And we're asking you to meet this people at the point of need for every man, woman, born, girl that's gathered together tonight. We're asking you to meet them tonight. We're at, oh God, I bless heaven. I'm asking you what I will put out as information. I'm looking to you, Holy Spirit, to make it revelation. And I pray and give us articulation of thought, articulation, Father, I'm asking you now, of articulation of speech, and I'm asking you for concision, conciseness of thought. We ask you tonight, we trust you, we believe you, we surrender in the awesome, in the matches. God, open up the Holy Writ, unlock these passages. We're asking you to unlock the seals. Give us that which is in your heart, on your mind tonight. We're asking in faith. We trust you. We believe you. In the awesome, in the matchless name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And every heart said, amen. Well, listen on tonight as we were talking about earlier. One thing I want to set up, I want to set a foundation tonight, and I want to show you something. Because as Jesus began to come, start talking about the kingdom, you start handling the kingdom, you need to be able to have a proper foundation for how the kingdom is revealed. And I want to show you something from Matthew. But the Bible says in Matthew how one of the things that Jesus did. Now the reason I'm emphasizing even talking about the kingdom when I talk about the trifecta of awakening, shaking, and visitations. Because in, in, Matt, in Hebrews, I should say the 12th chapter, and, and I want to look that up. Well, I'll come, let me come back to Matthew. Let me just give you a little bit right from Hebrews 12. Now in Hebrews 12, and y'all know what we've been talking about that for a moment. Because from there, we've been giving you an understanding about the shaking. Now, in Haggai, Haggai talks about that. This is, this is not something that just arrived, but I wanted you to, you to understand that uh, in Haggai, the, the, the second chapter, matter of fact, I'm going to get someone, I'm going to get someone to, to get that for me. In Haggai, we, we made a note in the second chapter, verse 6, verse 6 and 7. Somebody get that. Then also, I want you to write down, I didn't give you this earlier, but I'm going to give it to you now. Haggai, the second chapter, verse 6 and verse 7, to make a note of that. Also, uh, along with that, Luke 21. Luke 21. Because what I want you to understand that the things that were prophetically decreed and declared concerning the hour, concerning the time. Remember we told you about Matthew 16? Well, Jesus said, woe to the hypocrite. Uh, well, hypocrites, because you can discern the sky, but you cannot discern the times. And he was allowing you know, because any time the word woe is used, that's the strongest word that can be used in a judgment, when a woe is pronounced. So when Jesus pronounces in the 16th chapter of Matthew, when he pronounces the woe, that was a strong judgment that he was declaring on those who are playing roles, play acting, and pretending, to, to, pretending like they really understand what things are. And we're trying to warn people, even in these days, for folks who are trying to fake it till they make it, trying to pretend like they really got heaven's counsel, they really know what the Lord is saying in these days, and many of them have not heard from heaven. They've not heard from heaven. They, many are just hoping, just preaching something they think what people need, and we're not living in that kind of time. We're not in a day, in an hour, where you can do guesswork. Brother, because remember, in order for you to be effective to help people in spiritual warfare, remember what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 chapter, and verse 4 says, the weapons of our warfare. Let me tell you something, this act of area that we're up against. And here's what we can understand. Anytime kingdoms are clashing, this is what we've been telling you, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, demarcation lines have to be drawn. The side in which you own have to be drawn. Because my brothers and what you have to understand, when kingdoms are clashing and we're in a place like that, that sparks are going to fly. And that means you're going to have collateral damage. That means people, you're going to see things happen to people. You'll be wondering why. Man, I don't understand why, why this and why that. If you're not aware of where we are in time, you wind up becoming collateral damage. You wind up getting a blow, I mean getting debris. You know, it's kind of like a storm. Unless you understand what it be, that's why when they tell when storms hit, tornadoes hit, they tell you to go to a certain place. You gotta find a place of solidarity. You gotta mark your territory. You gotta find out the Lord be set in a place to allow you to be protected so that the debris, things on the on the peripheral do not catch you. So in a time like what we are now, that's why he tells us when he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. And so in that, you have to have a certain relationship, you have to be in a certain place with God because God has to begin to instruct you when it comes to spiritual warfare. When it comes to the answer, you know what he told us in, uh, in Ephesians 6, chapter 10, verse says, put on. 
Because here's what you got to understand. Even as a believer, even if you're born again, even if you're spirit filled, it doesn't mean you know how to war in the spirit. The Bible says we walk in the flesh, but we don't war after it. And here's what you got to understand. In when kingdoms are clashing, one of the main pressures that's going to be put on you is going to be the flesh. And which we tell people, even when you're talking about warfare, even when you're talking about, can you guys go ahead and handle that? Even in, in that, when we talk about warfare, we talk about the kingdom in, in a time like where we are right now. When we, when we speak about warfare and kingdoms clashing, here's what you got to understand. Here's what you need to know. In a place like where we are, when the Bible says that put on the whole armor of God, when it talks about putting on the whole armor, of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now notice he's talking to believers that already spirit feel people that already imbibe by the spirit. They already in a place in God. But yet when it comes to warfare, think about it. He said, put on. Okay, you would say, well, listen, if I gotta put this on, it requires me to add to where you already are in a place. Are you hearing me here? Because what happens is when it comes to spiritual warfare. And you got to understand, in those times, one of the things, one of the things that you're going to encounter from, from a satanic realm, from a satanic realm, deception is going to be the strongest weapon because here's the thing we think we discover about warfare. In warfare, in warfare, one of the main things that you're going to be hit with, number one, trying to get the element of surprise. The enemy can try to use the element of surprise. And the other thing is, is deception. Deception is going to be one of the strongest weapons in warfare. So in, that's why everybody don't qualify for it. We had time to go back over to Deuteronomy. And you remember in Deuteronomy, they told you that they would not allow, allow uh, the fearful and the unbelieving and folks who just got married. They wouldn't allow them to go to war. So if you're going to go to war, number one, you can't be fearful. Number one, you can't be unbelieving. Number one, you can't just fresh it. They would not have you just fre fresh it, covenant, just got a fresh new business, just got a fresh new wife. You couldn't go to war. And because of the fact that you would be thinking out there, you out there, you, you be thinking about the new bride, you just got married, and out of that, you also open yourself back at the house, wondering is, is, is homeboy back there knocking on your back door? You, is this happening, that going on? So, with that, they didn't let freshly married people go to war. They didn't allow the fearful and the unbelieving. You remember when, 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 when Gideon had 32,000, and the Lord said, You got 33,000, you got too many. You remember he began to prove them because he didn't want, want to make sure the people you're going to take the warfare. He let them go down to the, took them down to the river, and brook as they down there. And Jesus, said, all those who got down, got down on their face and drinking water, he said, let them go home. Because in warfare, think about it for a moment. People who are not conscious, think about it, you down on the ground drinking water with you, your, your eyes not up, you're not watching. You listen. You have to be able to understand. In warfare, requires strategy. You got to be strategic. Now you have to be strategic, you have to be tactical. Tactical has being tactical has to do with details. You gotta in warfare, you have to pay attention to details. And so in there, when God says put on the armor, it's something that you have to consciously activate. You gotta activate it. And then think about it for a moment. So when he says put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wilds. In other words, the, the, the armament is designed for you to take a position because that's what I was using about the demarcation line. You have to draw a line has to be drawn when it comes to warfare. You have to know which side you're on because you can't in, uh, in your battle cannot be ensued from any place. And that's why when the Bible says in Ephesians in the fifth chapter, He said, "Walk, don't be, don't walk as fools." In a time, in an evil day, you got to be strategic. You got to you got to be tactical. You got to understand details. You got to be able to know what a line of march is. You got to know what a rallying point is. You got to be able to have men. Listen, you got to have what they call uh, David when he was crying out to the Lord, "Help, Lord." It's called the godly men failed the faithful seats among men. And he was crying out those dreaded champions. He was telling, listen, he was crying out people that know how to fight and represent a cause. You got to have what we call standing battles. In a, in a fight, in a warfare, that's why even in the military, you got to have generals, you got to have those sergeants, you got to have those drill instructors. People who have been there before, got experience. People who know how to direct. You cannot have anybody, anybody telling you what to do in a fight. That's why it's amazing. Without millennials, I mean, so many of our young people listening to their peers, getting strategy from their peers. And I mean, we know what Michael, that happened to him when he started listening to the young men, them telling him what to do in the fight, and not listening to the ancient ones and the elders and, and those who had wisdom and had insight. My brother says, listen, you got to have people that have an experience, have a relationship with God. Know the heaven's counsel. Been in a fight before. 
I mean, understand what it is. David, when he came out against Goliath, the Bible said, man, just as God delivered the lion and delivered the bear, so he's going to deliver. He brought up his experience. He brought where he'd been with God. He knew what God was capable of. That's why he knew he couldn't use Saul's armor. Some of us right now, you're borrowing stuff from people. And that armor, you're borrowing someone else's armor, armament. A lot of you are borrowing from other people, getting certain things that God didn't get to you, didn't give to you, didn't make real to you. It ain't heartfelt. I mean, you, you don't know where God is in it. You, you don't know where you are in it. But you got it from here. You got it from over there. And you borrowed from there. And you got it from here. And this preaching, that preaching, that organization, this grouping, from this pay. My brothers, that's not the hour that we're in. It's not the time that we're in. We're in a day that whatever you're going to use has got to be proven. And I'm, we're going to talk about that in just a moment because I'm going to talk about the kingdom. Because every time Jesus talked to people, when he began to share with them, his life was proof of whatever he preached. Whatever Jesus declared, he was the, the Bible said he was the word made flesh. He had to be living proof of whatever he was going to declare. Because you got to understand, as it relates to the kingdom, because the kingdom doesn't come with observation. And so in order for people to catch the pattern, catch, you got to have living examples. You need in samples. You need people that have been there, done that, know how to reveal what's in Papa's heart. Because remember what Jesus came to do? Because he's bringing in the new kingdoms. He's introducing the lordship. He's, he's bringing, remember, he's bringing back Papa's right to rule. He's teaching folks on Papa got a right to rule. And he's showing them what his rights are. He's revealing to them how the kingdom operates. So remember, here's what I was saying in Hebrews 12. Notice what he says. In Hebrews 12, and he said that, he said, listen. Well, I'm sorry. That's going to have something to do with Haggai. Let me do Haggai 6 and 7, and then we'll come back to Hebrews 12. That got that? Haggai, uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 6. We got that? Read it out. Haggai, we got it? Don't have it? Well, let's do this. We don't have it. All right, Real quick, let me get it. All right, now, in Haggai, this word was prophesied. And, it, and for where we are now, in these times, the reason that we need to understand what, the heaven, what heaven is purposing and what God is planning, and what God is planning in this particular hour, because of the fight, because of the warfare, it's, and because of even the changing of the skin and what it's going to require to be in, in warfare. Now, in this, I'll say verse 6. Now, in Haggai 2, verse 6, it says, For this, for thus saith the Lord. Now, notice he said, For thus saith the Lord. This is the Lord speaking to Haggai in that particular day. Because what he's doing is he's comparing new order versus an old order. And so that's the thing about transition. Transition is moving you between two pillars. In transition, you're moving between two pillars. You're moving from the, from the known to the unknown. But the transitional place, that in-between place, is the place of confusion, disorder. Uh, in there where there's no known systems and structures, that's where you need prophetic voices. That where you need apostolic fathers. That where you need prophetic seers. That where you need intercessory seers. That where you need people that have developed history and relationship with God and can prophetically hear from God. And so that's the kind of place we're in right now. And so we're trying to get people to understand that we're in between pillars right now. We're in between the known and the not yet. That's why when the king, that's how you know a kingdom when the kingdom is being preached. Because the kingdom represents that which is and that that is not yet. Because remember, the king, kingdom is coming. It's here and it's coming. Because remember, the kingdom comes in increment. Remember, that was as kingdom is as a man casting seed. So you don't have the full corn in the area. And so in that, in Christ revealing the kingdom, he's teaching an increment because they, and you can't handle it because it don't come with observation. It's from the invisible world, the invisible realm. So as a result, because we're somewhere now, uh, we're somewhere now that we need to be far beyond where we are. So as a result, that God is aiding the process, and that's why the shaking exists. That's why you're seeing a lot of things that's taking place. And even with the spiking, and you're seeing the coronavirus cases, and people wonder about the spiking, because people starting to get a little bit comfortable, and people starting to feel a little bit confident about getting out and doing what they need to do. And particularly people observing and say, okay, well now we're going to start opening up things and, and start feeling good about it. But what I'm going to say to people is, we're not where we need to be yet. Papa is after something, and he's not going to relinqu he's not going to relinquish, he's not going to let up, he's not going to give up that ground. Because remember, when you start talking about lordship, you're talking about a landowner. You're talking, to, you're talking about someone Talking about with someone who is coming for a particular territory that's occupied by darkness. That's occupied by darkness and he's coming to take the land back. He's coming to take his territory back. That was the whole point of Jesus coming. Remember he said it. He came to seek. To seek that which 
was lost. So when we think about it, when Jesus came to the planet, something was lost. Something was not in order. Something was not in place. And he came, remember, Isaiah tells us that unto us a child is born and a son is given and the government is going to be upon his shoulders. Well, at the time that Isaiah was prophesying, he didn't have a body. I mean, he didn't have a body. He didn't have a church. He didn't have a body. And that's why he said in Matthew 16, he said, upon this I'm going to build. And so we see that he's still building. He's still building. It's not built yet. He's upon his rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Well, he's letting you know the kingdoms, the clashing of the kingdoms. Anywhere you see the Lord starting to expand territory, starting to build, the enemy's going to be pushed back. There is going to be retribution. There's going to be backlash. Anytime the Lord starts expanding, the enemy is pushing back because he don't want to give that territory. So, preacher, what you got that from? You remember when Jesus came up on the man that had the devils in him, and then as Jesus walked up on him, and the Spirit spoke out of the man and said, Why hast thou come to torment me before the time? Yeah. The Abbot says, Start speaking up because he don't want to give up that ground. Don't want to give up that territory. Are you hearing me up in here? So, as a result of him not wanting to give up that ground, that's the nature of kingdoms. They are trying, everybody's trying to hold on to that ground. Everybody's trying to not let go. So, in the midst of that shit, in the midst of that, the adversary said, He's going to push back. Anytime you're trying to expand, Jesus will come in with that territory. And he was coming to cast those devils out. And that's what I'm saying. In areas where people are occupying, where God has been pushed out, we're in a time right now where the Lord is coming back. He's back. He's back in the planet right in visitation form. And in visitation, it's like we use the word visit me. It's, ep it's epi, episcopos. It's like episcopal. Mean epi means over. Scope, episcope. Scope means to see. And you got someone who sees over, has the ability to be able to see over and understand and can bring order and bring arrangement, can set things in place. So the bishop, we said the bishop I saw, he's visiting, he's epi, he's epi, scopi, he, episcopos right now. Right now he's investigating, he's inspecting, he is seeing over, he's looking over, scrutinizing, looking at the order where we are. Because in the midst of this visitation that we're talking about, that's also, we told you that these are the worst of time, yet the best of time. Because it's, it's a paradox. You got a visitation of grandma, even the devil's visiting, visiting at the same time the bishop is in town. Are you hearing me right here? Because anytime somebody's trying to expand the territory, kingdoms are going to fight you. Nobody's going to give up a kingdom without a fight. Nobody's just giving up ground right here. You're going to have to fight. That's how king, kings got territory in the first place. They have to take it. They have to fight. They have to go to battle. They war. You remember what happened to Abraham in 13th chapter, Genesis, when they came and took his son Lot, I mean his nephew Lot, and took all the spoils and took things, and Abraham had to take up 300 of his servants, went after them five kings, went after them and went to battle to get that ground back and took that spoil. That's where he paid his tithe from. So here we are now. Here's what I pray you can hear me. We're in a place right now where there are spoils, and the atmosphere, there are things that have been taken from us, we're going to have to take back. There are things that the enemy has gained a hold of, we've got to get back. There's stuff that even the church... And, and I know a lot of us think, feel like where we are has really been against the house, really been against the church. The fact that you've been having, right now, some people are still trying to meter out a plan to get back to church, but they can start having church. But they don't even understand what it's about. You don't even know why we're trying to get a game plan so we can get back to church. The biggest thing is people focus on trying to get back. Man, don't let the biggest focus be in getting back. The issue is, what did you get? What are you gaining? Because here's what you got to understand. In order for you to be effective to take, the, take things on the ground, Baby, you gotta already be to capture that in the spirit. Are you hearing it? You gotta already listen. That's why vision is necessary. Vision is a glimpse of the end now. Vision is designed to help you put in disciplines. You know what he said? Without a vision, you know if you're not seeing where you're going, seeing what you're gonna catch, and seeing what you're gonna take. If you don't see it before you get there, you're never gonna get it. Because the issue with vision, vision imparts to you the disciplines that you need to achieve. That's how you know what stuff you ain't got time to be fooling with. That's how you know the folk you ain't got no time to be wasting no time with. Because vision helps clear the path to people that can work with you and people that can't. Because if you know where you're going, you know who can't fit. You know who belong on that path with. Because the path is, the, the gate is straight. The way is narrow. And you know that anybody can't go walk that way with you. So you need vision of where you're going. You need to understand before you get there, because you will need what vision gives you. Vision gives you discipline. It allows you to be patient. It allows you when certain things happen. And that's what he said in, when he said in, Hab in Habakkuk, depending on where you live, in Habakkuk, he said, write the vision. And he said, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets. Maybe he said, make it plain upon tablets. In other words, I want you to make, take the vision, beat it into the form of a plan. 
beat the vision into the form of a plan. It's, and it, beat it into the form of a plan so that he that read it, because here's what you got to, if you don't take time to hear what God's saying and then be able to table it and tablet to put it in plan form, because the old adage is, anytime you're not, the old adage is, if you, if you have failed the plan, then you have planned to fail. But here's the issue. We recognize that God said write the vision and be it in the form of a plan. So and the, here's the issue about plan because what written makes it legal. It allows you to fight that. Here's what we get up and tell people about warfare. In warfare, we said the devil's not just a liar, he's a lawyer. He's a, he masters in legalities. In other words, what's legal, he knows how to push back on you. He knows, and you know, that's what the Bible calls him accuser of the brethren. What is he accusing you of? Things that he knows is legal, that it, well, it's legal to take territory. It's legal to take things from you. It's legal to steal your harvest. It's legal. And many times our harvest will rot, rot on the vine. Things that God has that we never get. Because the adversary seduces us, deceives us. And that's why I told you you need to understand. You need to know, be not ignorant to save devices. I know what he says. Now in Haggai, I was reading this to you in a second, in the sixth verse. Notice what he says. He says, for thus said the Lord, the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while. And I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And notice what God said, I will shake the sea and the dry land. And he said, I will shake what all nations and, this, and, and the desire of all nations. He said, and, all, and the desire of all nations shall come. And he said, and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. Now we've seen this in, in measures. Because we know when Jesus came to the planet, he told him to go to the upper room and tarry and wait till you be endued with power. And he's talking about this house that he was building. And the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former. And so as a result, when Jesus came to the planet, he was prophesying. He was coming. Remember when he tried to, when he came to the planet, remember that the decree went out, kill all the babies up from two years old and under. Because they knew the Messiah had hit. They knew he was here. So the decree went out. The, the, listen, the kingdom got shook up. And say, put out a decree to kill all the babies. Because they knew that now the Messiah, they couldn't stop him from coming, but now that they're aware he's here. And so just something to put out a decree to kill off all the babies. All the babies from two years old and under. I mean, kill them out. And so as we kill out, I'm sorry, I should say, kill out the babies two years old, said two years old and under, in order to keep from the Messiah from thrusting. So we know he's talking about those male children. So he's trying to kill out. The, those babies, because there's a shakeup. Jesus coming to the planet was bringing a shakeup. Even as a baby, they could not afford for him to grow. They was trying to kill him out in his infantile stage. Are you hearing me here? So in that, as we think about this first shaking that came, and, and as Haggai is prophesying, talking about the Messiah coming and how the shaking that he's going to bring by virtue when he came to the planet. Because you know when Jesus once Jesus hit the streets, when Jesus hit the streets, man, it was on. And you remember what happened to John the Baptist? I mean, this, when, they, when they put him in prison, they, they locked him down. And we saw the shaking taking place because, see, now they locked John up. And John now, because John's in prison, he don't know what's going on in the street. Now he got to put markers out to find out what's going on. So his word was, uh, do, send his servant and say, listen, is this he or do we look for another? Jesus said, let me tell you how I'm shaking the place up. Because the Bible tells you how he went to all these different cities and began to upbraid the cities. Are you hearing me? Now, here's what I'm saying to you in this. Because I want you to understand, when we think about the pandemic, when we think about how this thing hit nations, when we think about this wasn't just a national thing. This thing hit the globe. And the Bible told you that nations were going to be stirred. So I'm emphasizing this from this standpoint. So you can see that as it, listen, all truths are parallel. Just as what was taking place in the natural, so was taking place in the spirit. So if the pandemic hit all these nations, what are all these nations going to need to be all right? What are they going to need? If they got the pandemic, they got the coronavirus, they got the hit, they got the sickness, they got it, what are they going to need? They're going to need to be healed. Are you hearing me? They're going to need healing. Are you hearing me? So this demand, think about it, put this demand for healing uh, at this hour, at this time. But guess what? The church is in the house. The church is on lock. The church is on lock now. But what does that mean? I mean, all these people needing healing, all these people in the hospital, all these folks, listen. We're on lockdown, so we can't, we can't invite them, we can't bring them to church. Well, what are we going to do? No, that means you got to get out in the streets. Because here's the issue. And I don't, didn't, 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 go, didn't go too much, but I gave you Matthew 9. We ain't got over there yet. Matthew 9, verse 35. It tells you when Jesus came, it, it came bringing the, the kingdom. The Bible said in the synagogues, he taught. But baby, in the street, he preached. The Bible said he came teaching 
and preaching. Teaching and preaching. Sister, listen, you're going to preach in the streets. You're going to get out here where the people are and preach. If your people can't come to you, the old attitude, man, if you can't, if you can't bring them, if you can't get Muhammad to the mountain, you bring the mountain to Muhammad. So what we got to understand is an hour right now, wherever you're restricted, if you can't bring the people to the synagogue where you can teach them, baby, you can show them to the street to preach. It's kind of like what we was having to do. We was going out to the, to the hospital, standing on the side, wherever they would allow us to be, and just preach to the walls. Put up sound system just begin to preach from there. I mean, wherever you can get, uh, listen, wherever you can get to get the word out, you need to be able to do that. Because right now, as God, listen, there's a shaking taking place, and what God is for, he's forging a new order. God forged it. He said, Brother Preacher, were you trying to say this is God? Absolutely. Not only is it God, it's a God and the devil. And the man to which told you it's all the above. Are you hearing me up in here? Kingdoms are flashing. These kind of things on global, on global fronts don't just happen accidentally. We're just trying to make sure that people are prepared. Let me show you some of the things that going so you can be able to see what's taking place. Even with our young people, and we're saying that we told them that even concerning what took place with, with Kobe Bryant, with his daughter, and how the focus and the emphasis is back on family. That's also one of the things that's going on. Right now, it was a grand opportunity to win family. It's another grand, whereas we made mistakes, as a lot of us didn't do it right, a lot of us didn't relate properly, not related properly to mama and dad and father and sister and brother. We got an opportunity to relate because we don't have much time. You see the way people are dying? Man, these deaths are showing you. The old adage is death speaks to the living. Are you hearing me? All these deaths, all these people dying, it's talking. That's a voice. Death has a voice. It's a portal. Anytime death takes place, it's, it's a portal opening for the living to come through. It's speaking to the living. Are you hearing me up in here? And so in that, the Bible says why when, when, when believers die, first Thessalonians 4 said, we don't die. We don't die like those that ain't got no hope because death for us is not the end. The death for us, it don't close nothing up. It don't shit. The grave don't cl close, I should say. The, graves don't, the grave don't close when a believer dies. It doesn't close. It doesn't close. It's open-ended. It's not over. It's not permanent. It's asleep. And as, a rec as we recognize that, we know we don't get all bent out of shape and scared to go out because people die. No, no. We start listening to God. Are you hearing me? Yeah. No, you, you're listening to God. You're listening for him. You're listening to what he's saying. Are you hearing me? Because listen, I see people who ain't, didn't go to church. They ain't been up in the building. Still ain't been there. And they dying anyway. They dying in other places, doing other things. Right. Folks are losing their life. And they're not in the church. Are you hearing me up in here? The issue, the key to, I don't care where you are, baby, you've got to be listening to God. We're in a time right now, and we're trying to get people to understand that what's taking place in our, out in our culture, and I'm going to read this to you, so we can get, get an understanding about what's taking place. Right now, in the midst of what's taking place, while people, some people are losing jobs, companies are closing and shutting down. Now, many people can read that, look at that, they would be just like the 10 spies who went over in Canaan, went over there and saw those giants, many came back with the tail between the legs and running back and said, man, there are giants over there. They came back, giants are over there. And God said, I'll call that an evil report. Yes. Are you hearing me up in here? Why is that? Because God had promised them the land. It had been prophesied they were going to get the land. But, what, but when you see things not going like you think they need to go and it looks like somebody protecting it. Well, here's what we try to tell people. Baby, all the high things are guarded. Anything that got real value, baby, they're going to be behind lock and key. So the fact that death is trying to block the door, trying to hinder, trying to hide, death, crisis, hardship, difficulties, these cases, violence is trying to hide the valuables. Are you hearing me? All high things are guarded. That's why the Bible says when you come into the house of the Lord, take the low seat. Because high places, you need to be asked to those places. Those places are supposed to have a porter at the gate. That's why the Bible says the porter only opens the gate to the true, true shepherd. He doesn't let the wolf in. He doesn't let the howl in. The porter, the Holy Spirit is the porter to the door. He don't let anybody in because the valuables are guarded. High things are guarded. We're in a high day right now. We told you God says I'm in a high day. It's my name day. It's the day for God to get honor. Let me get over here. I've been chomping at the bit to go here to Matthew. So I guess we're going to go over here in the ninth chapter of Matthew. Let's take a look for more. Real quick. Notice what it says in Matthew 35. Glory to the Lamb. Ain't God good? Now in Matthew, I want you to see this. In Matthew 35. And I, I'm tempted. Let me do this. In Matthew 9, verse, and notice what he, notice what he says. Mm. In verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities. Make yourself a note. Think about it. every state in the union 
They had the virus. So Jesus came into the kingdom. He went into every city. All the cities that was in this region, in the Palestinian region, he went to all the cities and villages. He, he, just, he, went, to, he went to suburbia America, I mean suburbia Jerusalem. He went, he went to the small town, rural town. He went to villages. He went to cities. And the Bible says he went there, 35th verse, teaching in the synagogues. And the Bible says, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then what? And healing every sickness and every disease. Are you hearing me? And I want you to make note, because when the kingdom comes, when the kingdom, here's what we're trying to get people to understand. When you start seeing signs of the kingdom, and one of the indicators of the kingdom is this call. You've been hearing so many preachers saying, God, we need to repent. And you can see it on, on billboards. You can see it on marquees. Second Chronicles, seventh chapter, verse 14. If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my faith, turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I hear. God says, I hear them from heaven. Repentance is a, it's a precluder. It's, it's a precipitator. It, it, it's, it's the prelude. Repentance is the prelude to the kingdom being revealed. Because remember, God is not going to, the will of God can't be done unless the kingdom has been revealed. And what the kingdom is, that means the domain of the king. That means God's impact on the planet with his influence and with his culture, with his ideas, right, with his morality, with his standards. So a proper impact on the planet, I mean influence on the planet with an impact, with the purpose of bringing about his will, his morality, his standards, in, in, into a place. When he comes, he's not going to put that anywhere. That's why Jesus came preaching the kingdom, came to declare what Papa was requiring. There are areas where people are not in that place. There are institutions that have pushed God out. God said what I'm coming for. He, it, it, we, I know we feel like certain things that God gave up the ground, he didn't give up the ground. Think about it for a moment. 400 years, almost 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. See, there was no widespread word from the Lord those period. John the Baptist come to the Bible one, crying in the wilderness, making straight. That's that prophetic voice crying in transition. Are you hearing me? And that's one reason I'm speaking the way I'm speaking right now and, and crying to me. So, praise and slow down, brother preacher. Slow down. Can you can't just kind of teach that thing? Yeah, I teach that thing when God released me to do it. But when you're in transition, when you're in a transitory place, baby, you gotta cry. Are you hearing me? See that word, that's what that word means. When Jesus said we, when he was teaching, that meant he spoke for you to learn. See, the word that when he said he was teaching in the synagogue, he instructed in a way so people could learn something. But when he's preaching something, he's crying. He's a public herald. He's crying. He's trying to get your attention. See, when I'm preaching, it's about your attention. When I'm teaching, I'm trying to do it where you can learn. I'm trying to give you an environment so you can learn something. So when he's saying right here, when he's saying, when he's saying that that's cool, it's the word for the word teach means to learn. He was teaching in a way that the people could learn. But when he was preaching, he was like a heralder. He was a public crier. He's trying to get folks' attention. Are you hearing me right here? In transitional place, that's what you got to do. In a synagogue, uh, up in here, you came to learn. You came for teaching. You came to learn. But baby, when you're talking to folk like out there on Facebook, sitting out there listening, you're talking to people, you're trying to be a public choir. You're trying to get somebody's attention. That's a time when you're sitting down and you're teaching, you're instructing. That some people got that virtue, that grace on them, that's all they're going to do the whole time because that's what God's required. But you, when you come to stand the barriers, when it comes to those people who are designed to show you the line of march and the rallying point, baby, they got to have a war cry. Are you hearing me? You need a war cry in the midst of warfare. Are you hearing that's why when Jesus brought them folks down to jail, brought down Jericho to war to come down, he said, baby, let me get you some cistrons, get you some pictures, and then we're going to march around this thing. So when we get down to the moment, I want y'all to shout. Are you hearing me? Because, baby, you got to make some noise. When you're in warfare, you got to have a war cry. Are you hearing me up in here? So we're trying to get people to understand where we are in time. You need prophetic voices to know how in a wilderness place, in that in-between the two pillars, the two of where we've been to where we're going. In that transitional place, you need prophetic voices. You need people that can see. You need people that can discern. And you need people that can warn. Are you hearing me? Warn you about things to come. Warn you about what's on the horizon. Because there are things coming. And we're trying to get people in position. And man, you listen, at places like that, you got to speak in a way to get people attention. So folk can't lay back. They can't have casual country. They can't stroll to their goal. They just got to think any kind of way it's just going to happen. Stuff going to happen because you want it to happen. Or because you don't want something to happen. It's not going to happen that way. The Bible said up until John, the kingdom of God suffered violence. And the Bible let those men are pressing into it. Then when it comes to the kingdom, you got to press into it. Are you hearing me? Paul said, I'm going to straight between two. And then he began to say, hey, listen, I'm pressing. Oh, then in Philippians, the third chapter, we said, listen, I want to know him. He said, I want to know him in the fellowship. I want to know him in the power of the resurrection. And I want to be made conformable 
going to do his death. And he said, listen, forget those things that are behind me. I'm reaching forth the things that are before me. And he said, I'm pressing toward the mark for the standard. Man, we're in an hour. you got to press. This is no time to stroll. Are you hearing me here? And so we're telling folks who are right now, that are on lock, sitting down in your, I mean, in your quadrants, in your corners, wherever you are right now, you're not able to do church like you want to. And a lot of you, uh, they've learned the new tricks. Now you learn how to work that phone. Now you learn how to work social media. Now you learn how to get up and be able to say, and now you got a new audience. And now you're going to try to figure out what you're going to do with it once you get back to church. But what I want to say, man, you need to be laying groundwork right now. And listen, I'm talking about it to you in Matthew 9, verse 35. Let's go back. If you look at Matthew 9, over there, Matthew 9, chapter, look at verse 35. I hope y'all can hear me up in here. Jesus didn't just teach. He had to cry. That word now means to cry. Oh, my God. What's he saying? Are y'all hearing me up in here? We said, he said, that, that's that word, the Greek word for the word caruso. Caruso means to be a public crier. Are you hearing me? So it tells you that Jesus was out in the public domain. When he was out in the public domain, he was crying. He was preaching because he was trying to capture people's attention. Because he was trying to get, bring attention to the kingdom. But notice what it says. And I said Matthew 9, 35, didn't it? And notice what it says in verse 35. He said, Jesus went about all the cities and villages. And what I'm saying is right now, there are people that are already positioning themselves, trying to reach all the counties in the state of Alabama. They're trying to reach as a group, and they call them the fire teams. And they're out there with a vision. They're trying to reach every county in the state of Alabama. And this is because I'm trying to tell you, these are emblematic things that signify the kingdom is looking for more territory. So while some people are on lock, the other folks are finding more strategic ways to get out and finding other areas in which to get the gospel out. Are you hearing me? They're not being locked down because the building ain't open. Because the building ain't what makes the church, right? They call the church once we get there. And notice what he says. And it's as, he preaching, as he's teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and the Bible said, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And notice what he said, but the Thursday verse, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. And he said, and were scattered abroad. Are you hearing me? Yeah. As sheep having no shepherd. I think we're in the midst of that right now. I think we right got a situation right now where certain things have gone down, certain things are hard, and people have fainted. Because some things that happen in our region, some major ministries got hit. Some major congregations just got a major hit. And as a result, there are folk out there walking around. They don't know what to do. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Are you hearing me? And Jesus saw them and said, I said, have compassion on them. Are you hearing me? And so we're in a time now where you got to have some people can be able to discern what's taking place and see that you got to have folks that got a heart of compassion. They can see the state of affairs of the people. And understand right now, as he saw the people, what the state of their affairs, they were go, moving like, there was, like sheep that had no shepherd. And right now you got ministers right now that just took a major hit because I'm telling you there's a major assault. And we're letting people know that this is a time of visitation of grand mal evil, but at the same time, great blessing. And so you and I got to be able to discern the harvest. And know what he says. He's looking at the people. And the Bible says, after he saw these people, and looking at verse, verse 37, it says, Then said he unto his disciples. Now think about it. Now here are people sad. Here are people displaced. Here are people that are lost out. People, hearts are broken because a ministry just got, took a hit. Their leaders just took a hit. Things just happened. And now people are disenfranchised, disillusioned. They're wounded, they're bruised, they're hurt. And they don't know what to do. And, and, and think about the state that they're in. And this is what Jesus, how Jesus surmised what he saw. This is how he turned it. This is the terms he put on that condition. Notice what he said. He said, but when he saw the multitudes. And he said, we saw them, and he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. But 37 verse said, but then said he unto his disciples. The what? The harvest is truly plenteous, but the labors of you. He said, so pray you the Lord of the harvest. Now see, at the time Jesus saw these people scattered and saw that they were disconnected, saw things that happened, they were separated out at the time they had come. And that's kind of where we are right now, state of affairs, because we got people out there, some people that I know who just having this dialogue in the pastor's meeting. There are folk out there that are calling and say, well, listen, can you mind, can you give me your address? Uh, because right now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm separated from my church right now, and I want to be able to send my tithe somewhere. I want to be able to give my tithe somewhere while until I can find a place. And you know, it really hurt 
And so we was having this discussion, discussion with some of the pastors on some of the people that are out here that have been, that have been separated from their church, separated from their ministry, and they're really hurt and they're really wounded. And, you know, they don't want to just immediately go join somewhere right now because they just, they just came to a hard place. So they're now like sheep without a shepherd, but God calls that place a harvest field. That's a harvest. Are you hearing me? And so in that being able to discern that, we got to, but listen, but you got to have the right heart. You got to have the right mind. You got to see, just saw them and say, have compassion on the people. And begin to say, listen, we need laborers. Now, we need workers. We need a holy believing. Uh, they said, holy believing. Laborers. We need you to pray the Lord of the heart. He's sent into his end time harvest. Holy believe, divinely appointed. We need folk that know what they're doing. Don't send anybody out there because these people are tender. Their hearts are tender. They're wounded. They're fainted. They, listen, they're bruised. Right, they're disillusioned. You need people that know how to recover them. Everybody don't know how. A lot of folk get out there trying to show them screw. Well, see, I know you should have did this. See, ah, we knew them folk, but then we knew that wasn't all that. And that ain't this ain't no time for that. The Bible said Jesus had compassion. Baby, when you're seeing people hurt, church broke down, folk can't be in their building, can't do what they need to do. Ain't no time to be stupid. Ain't no time to be placing blame. Ain't no time for you getting your chest out. Ain't no time for you feeling good. Ain't no time because now you think your ministry is back on the top. Now you're back in your position. Now you're back in your seat. Baby, it's time for you to be able to feel the pain of the people. It's time for you to understand people are hurting. It's time for you to have the heart that Jesus had when you see people disillusioned and they're like right they're scattered, they're abroad, and they don't have a shepherd right now, and they don't know what to do. It's time to have a heart of compassion. We need people who know how to work the field. Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And not going out telling people, yeah, you had no business leaving. If you haven't leave, you haven't have not gone over there, you haven't been there. We already know that. They know that. Right. Are you hearing me? They know that. Come on, church. Ain't no time for that. Yeah. We're in a kingdom mandate right now. And that's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong mindset. Because God said, I'm, as, a, as, a, as a shaking is taking place, and God said, I'm, we're receiving the kingdom. Because that kind of stupid stuff can easily be shaken. I never will forget, there was a local minister here in the city. And you know, he was kind of a word of faith man. And I mean, word of faith man, preaching strong faith. And I always used to say things, but listen, you, you folks ain't got a word, and you can come over here and get out in church. And you know, it's just to make certain statements. So one day something happened. Something happened to that ministry. He was telling folk to lead in church. If they ain't preaching the word, if they ain't preaching the word, they ain't doing this, they ain't doing that. Man, it's not telling folk if they ain't preaching the word. How you hear me? Because you may not be preaching the word either. Hello? And so after this, something happened. And then all of a sudden this ministry took a hit. Next thing you know, that ministry went down. And you know, it, 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 and at the time it happened, I was kind of glad. At the time, listen to me now. I'm just confessing something here. Confessing is good for the soul, right? And so in that, God jumped me, immediately jumped me. And he said, now, what I want you to do is put yourself in that seat. He said, now, if that was you, what would you want people to do? Tell me what you want them to do if it was you. And so in that, I got down on my face. I began to weep and cry out for that man and cry out for his ministry and repent it before God because I need to have a heart of compassion. When people, when leaders are hit, irrespective of what we think about them, the people can be whatever, but you don't know why people are where they are. But I come to understand something that day. And so you don't learn true love, never rejoice. Never rejoice in, never rejoice in a man's downfall or his sin or when, when someone missed the mark. But it only rejoices when righteousness and truth prevails. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, right? right? We never rejoice in another man's fault. We never rejoice when people are down. Because you don't never know when you have a visitation. You don't never know when you can get caught crosswise. So I repented before God. I got down on my face and I wept for that man. I asked God to have mercy. I asked him to forgive me. I repented. And I changed my attitude about it, irrespective of what I thought. And some of us, I'm telling you, this is a difficult time. with a difficult hour. We still need every able-bodied man and woman. And that's what's up. You got to watch how you're handling folk in the kingdom when things are shaking. Because you got to have the right attitude. Because if not, then when that storm comes and testing that ground where you got, where you're occupying that judgmental spirit, that elitist spirit, you got to watch that thing being elitist. I'm thinking you, 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 you all that because at, at somebody else's downfall, somebody else's expense. Listen, I don't ever want to be great because somebody else is down. Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. I want to be great because I've served the master. 
Bible says, "Isn't it going to be great among let him become your servant?" I want to be able to have done what God requires me to do and give him the right attitude and have the heart of a servant in the time you need it. So in this time, we're trying to get people to understand. And you know, we're talking about even our young people. You know, I've thought about it all of a sudden. I don't have the time to finish this, but look. But let me, let me do this. Got a few minutes. Let's do this. If you want to go real quick over to Matthew. Matthew, the fourth chapter, real quick. Just come run with me. I'm almost, through, almost out. But I want to give you this. In Matthew 4. Oh, yeah. The fourth chapter, verse, I told you, verse 23. Let's look at it real quick. Because what we're trying to get people to understand. You know, it was Father's Day. And I'm still shouting out to those fathers out there. We're still encouraging them. Thank God for all, all of you uh, that, that are out there that are fathers and enjoyed on Sunday. I pray to God that that family and people that know you, honored you, and acknowledge you because this is a special time. And this is part of it because this is a time for family. Anytime it's a time for fathers because the same word is used. But it's a time for fathers because the family is in the father. And to be a father means to be vitally connected to other relationships. Because as a father, as we use on Sunday, we talk about the fact in order, to be, in order for you to be a father, you have to have a wife. In order to be a wife, in order for you to be a father, she had to be willing to be a mother. Are you hearing me? She's got to cooperate. She got to be willing to be a mother. And then not only she got to be willing to be able to be able to receive seed, but she got to be willing to walk nine months to that thing come to full fruition. So she's carrying the pain while you are carrying the trophy. Yeah, yeah. You drop seed, but baby girl, but, but baby girl got to incubate. And so you need someone who don't mind being a mother. And so when you come to being a father, there's a lot of components that are in that thing for you to be there. You don't get to be a father because you got gentle, you care and see. You need a woman. That's one about when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Why? Because when you find a real wife, she's going to be willing to be a mother. She's going to be willing to be able to incubate for nine months on every, how many other children y'all decide you want to have. Are you hearing me up in here? She's got to be willing every time to carry that thing to full nine yards. She got to be willing to go yard, as we like to say. She got to be willing to go yard every time that we want children. And so it's important and it's significant, in particular in this time, because this is the time. And as a matter of fact, I'll stop right here and say this. Because we have a time family. It's a time for family. And I was, I was reminding my brother-in-law that we had made a commitment to sit down after my, after my nephew was killed. As he was killed over there in the, the motorcycle club. I mean, boy, I was 37 years old, taken out of here. And we made up our mind, right, and I felt so bad doing that home going, that home going. And I repented to the people in the home going because I felt so bad about it. Because I felt like, and even though I had talked to him, and we had talked, and he talked about it, it came out of the streets. But I felt like there was so much more could have been done. So I allowed to use that death to talk to my life to help save other lives. So we sat down. We said we're going to set up. We're going to meet with the family. We're going to sit down with these boys. We're going to sit down with these young guys. And guys who are not really paying attention out here. It's about whatever's going on. They're trying to be hip. They're trying to be cool. They're trying to be in the moment. They're trying to be hot. They're trying to be relevant. And all those things. But baby, when death come knocking, it don't care about none of that. Are you hearing me? So with that, I remind my brother, we was talking about it. I said, listen, man, we got to go back. Because see, what happened in the midst of we had decided to sit down with the family and sit down and talk to them. After that boy was snatched out of here, we know how everybody was feeling. That boy was stolen. That boy was taken out of here. And so we want to make sure that there won't be another one just stolen and taken out of here without us spending some level of time trying to impart some level of heaven's counsel and trying to reveal and show them what heaven is purpose. And so in that, we set up... Try to scare up a date, set up time, and that's when coronavirus hit. And we'll put on, we'll put on hold and delay. And so on yesterday, we revisited that place. I said, listen, we need to get, I said, we need to get back together. I said, no, kind of, he said, yeah, but it ain't bothering the default. They, they ain't stopping. The young folks, they still, they out there doing everything. If they can get out there and do that, we can go have a meeting, sit down, and let's get with it. But I purpose in my heart, because of where we are in town, and because I was using this as an example, I'm saying with Kobe Bryant, saying about his daughter, that it was also indicating those nine people on that plane were speaking about the finality in terms of family. It was talking about family. It was setting us up for this hour, because not only that, his heart toward children, his impact on so many. Remember when that boy, when that boy died, and his family and all those people died, the globe was touched. And we're telling people that we're in Malachi 4. The hearts of the fathers are returned to the children. And the hearts of the children are returned to the fathers. 
We're in that place. Are you hearing me? And that's a move of God taking place. I know people are trying to get a little bit confused about where we are. But baby, when, I, when we saw that the guy who was doing tattoos, you know, people who doing, got, uh, got those Confederate flags, swatch stickers on their arms, here's the guy said, I'm willing to take off all these stickers of everybody who wanted it removed. And because of the fact that he had had a change of heart, God had done something in him, changed a man from his racist, segregationist, discriminatory attitude, had had a change in heart, God done broke the wind on him, and I'm willing to everybody who want these things removed. And you had a lot of people giving those swastikas, giving those Confederate flags off of their arms. And I'm telling you right now, because there's a shaking taking place, and the kingdoms, the kingdom is being ensued. Papa is saying we're receiving something. There's something coming from the throne. The bishop of our soul is in the land. And he's inspecting, he's upgrading cities right now. He's going telling you the spirit of the Lord is in this place. It's in the city. It's in the town right now. And here's one thing I want to share this with you. I won't even get to Matthew 4. Don't worry about it. But here's what I'm going to say. Just as you saw what, what Jesus was doing, you're going to begin to hear it like you've never heard it before. People are going to start going to cities, going to villages, going to rural areas, going to towns, bringing the gospel of the kingdom. You're getting ready to hear God is coming to, God's right to rule is coming back to the planet. You are getting ready to hear And not only that, and I didn't get a chance to go over to Matthew 4, but you get a chance, you go look. 23rd, 24 verses, and you take a look when he was speaking. And he began to talk about how that Jesus began to heal all manner of sicknesses, palsies. I mean, all, all kinds of sicknesses. I'm saying to you, those same things that you're seeing in that book are going to be recorded in our day. Because I'm telling people, I'm trying to get them to understand, we're in biblical times. I want you to know right now for where we are, what's taking place with the coronavirus, with the protests, and with the racial divide, and even people that are out there, these perpetrators that are out there trying to create a race war in the midst of what's taking place. While all, I mean, all, listen, you look at the hearts on people and how people are rallying behind the cause. And I mean, even you got people, I'm talking about, who was espousing hate, changing their minds, repenting, turning. One young man came over to one of the sisters and said, listen, 18 years old, said, man, when he heard and found out that it wasn't in reality, it was no superior, the superior race is the one race. Not different races, no, no white race, no red, no yellow, no black race is superior. God made every man from one blood. And we came to understand there's only one race, and that's the human race. And that's who God designed. When God said in Genesis 1 26, let us make man. That's the race we're running. We're running in the race to be a human man. That's a man with a spirit. That's one that's built and made in the image and the likeness of God. And anytime you try to divide out from another people, and make yourself because of where you thought you were born or because of the, 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 the texture of your hair or the color of your skin, of skin the, the texture of your skin or the color of your eyes. Baby girl, you just disqualified yourself from the human race. You just separated out from the image and the likeness. Because when God came to the planet, Psalm 113 says, God stooped down to behold the heavens and the earth. God had to stoop for you to know him. In order for us to know God, he had to humble himself. So in order for you to know him, you got to humble yourself to see him. Are you hearing me? If he had to humble himself to reveal himself, it's going to take you bowing down to see him. Are you hearing me? That's why he gives grace to the humble. Are you hearing me? Listen. We love him. We thank God for all of you. But I want to say to those of you who have not made the decision, have not done what you need to do, I want you to understand that folks who not made, quite made a decision, never ask the Lord to come into your life. And like I said, right now there's a knock at the door. And the Lord saying, if there's any man who will, will hear my voice, he said, we'll open the door and say, I come in and suffer with him and heal with me. We just believe in a tremendous time what God really wants to do. He wants to reveal himself in great measures. And it's an hour, it's, a, it's an hour, a tremendous hour of family. Time right now. And I got those, and we also urging people, that relationship you got, that people that you know. And we're trying to get people to have conversation. We're trying to get people to interview people. Some people that you know, some people that you've been knowing why you never brought up the, the, the question about race, or about color. And I know that those people say, well, you know, I don't see color. Huh? You don't? Yeah, right. Yeah, right, you don't see it. Yeah, until, until something happened. Yeah. Something happened, then we know what you see. Yeah. Are you hearing me? 
That, so that's not real. Stop playing. Listen, we're not trying to deny anybody their culture, deny anybody where they came from. We want to embrace it. That's what unity is. A unity is not sameness. It's not everybody the same. It's embracing the diversity of their giftings and their grace and pooling them for one common goal. It's everybody pooling diversity. Are you hearing me? And so in order to, in, for you to be achieved, it requires diversity being embraced. You can embrace people's differences. I'm not trying to, listen, I ain't gonna say that I don't, I don't see you as a lighter pigment of skin, brother. I don't see you as, as being white. Well, what color are you then? Yes. God got a rainbow, seven spirits of God. Yes. God colored people a certain, he did that, he did that oh, hue. Glory. He did that tint. Yes. That's God's tint, that's his brush. Yes. That's his stroke. God put that stroke on you. Whatever color you are, whatever the texture of your skin, God put that texture on you. He put that twist on you. That represents the sevenfold colors of God, sevenfold spirits of God. And it's reflecting, listen, the prism of his nature. God is diverse in his nature. He didn't just say, oh, I'm making man. No, let us. Diversity made the man. God said, let us make man. There was diversity went into our, our composition into the very complex. That's why we're so complex. And it requires God to reveal himself to us to be able to appreciate each other. Yeah. That's why the Bible said God can't be discerned unless we find out how to treat each other. Until we discover that, God can't be seen. God can only be seen when our diverseness starts to embrace the unity. We start to embrace our togetherness, then God can be seen. The Bible said unless you love one another, the world can't see him. Yeah. You can't stand on the corner by yourself and you got it all going on by yourself and think they can see God. I can't see God in there. Because other people put a demand on you because you can't love alone. Yes. You need love needs an object. You need somebody different from you, adverse to you, that puts a challenge, to put a demand on your flesh to have to live above it for God to be seen. Are you hearing me? Yes. And listen. So for those of you that are online and listening right now, if you've never asked the Lord to come into your heart, if you've never invited. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. And I'm going to get you right now to repeat after me because you can know when you're going to spend eternity. A lot of people are not sure that if they die today, they're not sure they're going to spend eternity. They don't know when they're going to wind up, but you can be. And so I want you to agree with me. I'm going to agree with you. We're going to pray together. And I want you to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I repent. Me a sinner. And Lord, I'm asking you according to Romans 10, chapter, according to your word. You said I will confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. If I believe in my heart that he died for my sins and that God raised him from the dead to my justification, my justification that I might be free, you said I could be saved. So I want to decree right now, along with you, as you're repeating after me, you said, Lord, I want the fruit of the Spirit abiding in my life. I want the gifts of the Spirit I want you to have full control. I renounce Satan in all of his cohorts, in all of his deeds. My will is to do the will of the Lord on the will of the Father. That's my will. But I decree over you from the crown of your head to the soul of your feet. If you pray that prayer and you believe God with me, it's my prayer that what you confess with your mouth about his Lordship, that you believe that in your heart. And I believe in that place, a miracle is going to take place. And God's going to do something special in your life, in your heart. And that you'll know it completely. So I bless heaven for you tonight. And I believe in God, that's God from here to moving from right here. If you need further instructions, if you're not in a church right now, you're not going to a place where I want to give you, just give me a number where we can direct you because we don't know exactly where you are receiving this prayer. But we, maybe we can direct, direct you some ministry, whatever area that you're in. There's a number that's on the screen. It's 205-383-0171 that you can call. And you can get further directions, letting you know what to do next. We always try to urge people, but we know right now a lot of people are challenged when it comes to church. And we're not sure exactly who's, who's in church right now. Some people are going back.
and others are still working on a game plan to go back. But whatever the case may be, we'll try to assist you the best that we can with people who are have a plan in place and people that are coming in church so you can be safe here in a safe environment where people are, they're, they're spraying the place down, they're making available for you masks or whatever you, you need. And so, if you would, that number is 205-383-0171. Well, listen, I want to encourage you, all of you that are online. We always always try to get people because we, we, we know we're in a special place. This is a harvest season. And we told you from Matthew 3, verse 12, the Bible said, the Lord says, my fan is in my hand. And I'm thoroughly purging my floor. And that's a harvest season. Because, when the, when, see, there's a special wind that always blows during harvest time. The Bible tells you that even Jordan, the Jordan, during harvest time, the Jordan used to always flood. There are certain things that happen in a harvest. See, people, some people keep looking at the flood and they miss the harvest. So, so you need people that can point the harvest. That's why Jesus had to speak. You know, when he was wondering, when he was talking about the harvest, there's, there's times when Jesus said, listen, the fields are already white. They couldn't see that. They couldn't discern that. He said, the fields are already white, and they're ready to be harvested. You need people that can see harvest is not all. That's why I said valuables are guarded. Man, the gold seals dressed on, they ain't nothing laying on the ground. You can't walk up and find good stuff. You're not going to know when it's harvest time unless it's announced. There's certain things that indicate. That's why you need standard bearers. That's why you need leaders. That's why God said, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach unless he sit? Because you need someone who has come from the bosom, came from the heart of the Father, who has real care for God's people. And they can help prepare them, help get them ready for where we are. Well, listen, we thank God for you. Do want to know on, on the screen, we do have Give a Five where you can support the many you can give. And one reason we keep emphasizing that to people is from this standpoint. Is it because we're in a harvest season? God's doing some special things. Matter of fact, I just say this to you. The other night, I, oh, it was last night, I went to Target. I had bought something about my grandson. He needed to cut his hair. My son needed to cut his hair. And I wanted to go buy a, a, a razor, a, a buyer, a clipper, a clippers. And what I, what I bought wasn't real clippers. And so I had to take them back. Well, I, I'm going to take them back. I said, you know, since I bought it, I just use it for trimming. Got it, plugged the thing up, and it didn't work. So it's been in my car for almost a month. So I thought about it yesterday, so I'm taking it back. So I took it back there and went to go get something in place of it, because I forgot I did on my wife's card. I thought it was mine, I gave my card. He said, oh no sir, no, it's not on that card, not on that card. I said, what? And I had to think, I said, that's right. I used Lady Grill's card when I purchased that. So, but I had the receipt in my wallet. And at any rate, through all that, when I went back and forth, as I was walking down the aisle, all of a sudden, right there on the floor, is a quarter. Mm. Mm. Now, for those of you who don't understand what those coins mean, I get it. But me and God, we got a covenant around those coins. When I find the quarter, that's a raise. That's a promotion. That's an elevation. Because normally I'm finding pennies and dimes, and I know what those signify. When I find the quarter, you, 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 when I find the quarter, you can always tell them my, my, my smile will be that way. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And I'm emphasizing that because I'm trying to tell people we're in a time right now. We're a time where God is really doing some special things. And so I just want to share that with you. And I'm here, I'm just telling you that. And as a matter of fact, I, I had it sitting right here. And just to show you, just to show you that I found the quarter last night. When I got here tonight, uh, Jordan, bring me that black bag right quick. Right up here. Right here. I, I'm gonna show you something. I got here tonight. Uh-uh, the other one. The other one. Yes. I got here tonight. Thank you. You on candy can? So I got here, walked in the door tonight, and a man that brought me this, brought me this envelope. And I said, and it's been a long time since these people were here. It's been a long time. But God was letting you know, there's a raise, there's a raise coming. And I'm talking about 24 hours. 
And there it is. So I'm emphasizing that to you, not because I need money, even though I need money, but not because I need it. We'll be talking to you about it. When I need it, I don't know who to talk to about those kind of things. I hear me. And so I'm just going to say something, but I'm saying something to people that need God to move on you and for you. I want you to make a note that because it's given files on the screen. And listen, I don't play, I don't play games with, 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 with gimmicks and stuff like that. I don't need it. Never have needed it. And because God is who he, exactly who he say he is. And he does everything. And if you can't, by this now, if you've been listening to me, by now, if you can't tell you how passionate I am about who I believe God is, because I'm so passionate about it, to me, I had to prove this thing on the front end. Because if God didn't do what he said, I couldn't preach it. I'm too passionate. And stuff don't show up, don't work. But God didn't do miracles. If he ain't going to do it, I won't be telling you what you're getting ready to see if I don't believe God's going to do it. But I'm telling you right now, you're getting ready to see people getting ready to be healed. And I'm not talking about why we're waiting on no serum, waiting on no vaccine. I'm talking about the, the antidote is already here. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, God's going to begin to demonstrate his power. And I want to encourage folks that are right now that are having to go into these hospitals, having to go alone, and your folks can't go. Let me tell you, man, keep your head up. And don't let, by being by yourself, don't you let, don't you let being there disappoint you. Because let me tell you something, because your folk can't go, and don't stop the Holy Ghost. I am it. And it don't stop prayer. And it doesn't stop God's word. And it doesn't stop the spirit of God. And it does not stop Papa. Papa can go beyond the walls. Are you hearing me? And I want you to see yourself. And you're listening to me from the hospital room. I don't want you to be there like you by yourself because you're not. There's nowhere that God's not. God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. God is present in every direction. And I know we got hurting people out here. But God's here for you. And we found out in the book of Genesis, God didn't wait till you have a problem to have a solution. Before God put the man in the garden, he already put water. He already put vegetation. He already made a beast of the field. He already put animals, put fish. Fish was, fish was put there. Water was put there. Listen, vegetation was put in the planet before he made the man. To let him know how much he understood what you need. That's why he says it. According to Matthew 6, does he seek first the kingdom of God? God got you. He know what's first. In the beginning, God. God was first. And he understood what came next. He understands order. And as the scripture said, if God gave you ears and you can hear, you think he can? How in the world someone can create ears for you and they deaf? Are you hearing me? God can hear. That's why he gave you ears. He gave you ears so you can know. Know what he can do. Gave you eyes to see, let you know what he can do. Made you in his image and his likeness. Am I right about it? We just want to encourage people. Don't let the enemy play you. Because things that you want to be done, right now you're not in a position where you can make it happen. But let me tell you something. God doesn't need that to be who he is. It, whatever you seem to be at a, lot, at a loss for, and whatever be lacking, God still can meet you at the point of your need. He still can make up the ground. He's still an equalizer. And that's what David said in Psalm 16. He said, I've set the Lord always at my right hand that I shall not be moved. And the word set means to be an equalizer. Meaning that wherever you ain't, you ain't up to the task, wherever you short, wherever, I used to say all the time, now I have certain things, I ain't got enough bricks in my pocket. I don't weigh enough for that situation. I hear me. Because that's the word for the word glory. Kabol, weightiness. You got to be heavy enough to get certain level of honor and dignity conferred on you. You got to wait. And God is so heavy, so weighted. I mean, the glory, we're talking about the glory of God, how heavy, how weighted he is. Isaiah talked about it. Are you hearing me? In the year that King Uzziah died, and when he saw something, and he never seen the glory like that before. He didn't realize it. And then the, the seraphims had to go deeper than that. He saw it in the temple, and it filled it. The seraphims saw it in the earth, and it filled it. Are y'all hear me? So I just want you to know God is pretty heavy. And he knows how to equalize. Whatever you short, baby, he knows how to make up the ground. I just want to encourage you right here. And listen, as we're approaching the close, I want to encourage all of you. And I want to agree with you and believe in that, that God's going to begin to meet those of you that are challenged. And somebody right now that may be challenged. Oh, God, I feel something in this man. Right there, I want to pray for somebody that's, that's an oppressive spirit. And it's a disillusional spirit because you've been feeling kind of left out, oppressed, pressed down. That I can feel that oppressive thing. We're just going to break the power of that right quick. Let's go with me. Father, we just release the authority of heaven and the power of the Holy Ghost. We 
cancel wicked, vile, diabolical plots that's been set against God's people. We cancel your assignment, we cut you off, we destroy your influence, and I rebuke that spirit. I agree with the saints, I'm agreeing with the people of God, we're agreeing together, we're releasing heaven's authority, heaven's power over you now. I said, Jesus, according to Matthew 9, Jesus healed all, he said, every kind of sickness and disease, he was healing people. And so I'm decreeing right now where you are warring against this demonic force. I command heaven's authority. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we have to impact your heart and your mind. And I rebuke that spirit that's been oppressing you, aggravating you, and agitating you. I cancel that assignment. Loose them now and let them go. I command heaven's authority. Now, in Jesus' awesome master's name, we pray. Neighbor heart said, Amen. Listen, we thank God for you. We want to say, as we always say in our closing, 1 Corinthians 15 57 says, Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus, and you have got to be encouraged today.